For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. It's the work of God. The gift of God. Not by the works of men so that no one can boast. These two verses from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, really brings about what the subject matter of this series is all about. The series is about the grace of God and He and His plan of salvation. Jesus coming to this earth. Jesus being raised on the cross and coming out of that empty tomb. Living a life without sin. The grace of God has reached all of mankind through Christ. Amen? For it is by grace we have been saved. And that is such a true statement. And it is through faith. It is the gift of God. Not by the works of men so that no one can boast. God and God alone put together this system of salvation for you and for me. Amen? And our response in this matter of God's grace to get to heaven, oh, I so want to go there, is faith. And here's where the problem is. Mankind has messed up the concept of faith. God's grace, our faith. Last week we began this journey called the faith chain. And what I want us to do is to make sure that we understand what the faith is that saves. There are so many faiths out there that are being taught. So many that are being taught. This sort of cafeteria style. Pick the faith of your choice. It's going to be good enough to get you into heaven. That's not the plan God put together. And out of anybody in this world, those of us who proclaim to be a part of his one true church, his one true body, we better know what the faith is, or we're not going either. And so, brothers and sisters, this series, as I said last week, I have fear and trepidation. I also have this great excitement about sharing this series of lessons with you. But the fear and trepidation is, is because what this insists that you do as an audience is be active and alert and think and want to be a part of it, want to learn it, want to soak it in. It takes effort on the audience's part to go through an academic series like this. This lesson is just as much on you as it is on me. It's easy to sit in an audience when a preacher gets up to do something that edifies, something that just, you know, makes you feel good. Man, to feel good sermons, you can sit back and go, wow, all I have to do is just feel good about me. That's not this series, man. This one's on you and me, and I'm praying, I'm praying, I am praying that you really want to have the faith. And so let's do it. Last week... I tried to help us see that faith is very much like a container. I had my little handy-dandy jug, and I couldn't find it. I had a handy-dandy gallon, plastic gallon jug, and it was empty. And I used it as an illustration to try to show what faith is. You see, you define the plastic jug by the contents or the substance or the ingredients inside the jug so if I had it filled with sweet tea, I could hold it up and you'd folks would say, well, yeah, man, that's a, that's a jug of sweet tea. It's still a jug, but it's the contents inside that define what the jug is. And you see, that's what faith is. Faith is this container that has all of the substance within it, all these ingredients within it, and that defines then what the faith is. And our Lord and Savior teaches us what the faith is that saves, that leads to eternal life. And so that means that our faith container needs to have the substance of the faith that will get us to heaven. Now, to do this, what we did is last week we started off recognizing that to find the ingredients, to find the substance, to know what faith is, you must go to God's word and God's word only. Faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Our Bible says that as clear as clear can be. 
we walked through the process of recognizing that Jesus Christ himself was saved by grace through faith. Jesus could not get back to heaven unless he had the faith that God the Father taught and Jesus followed to get there. And it's no different for us. If you want to know what faith truly is, you have to find it and identify it in God's word and God's word alone. Now what this does is this. It cuts through the pastors, the preachers, the priests, the parents. It cuts through religious tradition and religious opinion. Because there's enough of that going around. And it gets us right back to what God actually says. Faith is. So, as we understand now the source of faith, what is the substance? Where does it begin? What's the first ingredient that goes into this faith? Who here wants to go to heaven? Okay, most of you, that's good. I'm telling you right now, this very first ingredient, this very first substance in this container called faith is an absolute imperative because when it is weak, your faith is weak. If you don't have it, you won't have it. This is the very building block, the very beginning building block of what faith truly is, and it is belief. It is hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, and deciding whether you are going to believe in it or not. I liken this process to the fruit juice aisle in the grocery store. Some of you are thinking, Tad has lost his mind. How is he trying to compare belief to the fruit juice aisle in a grocery store? Well, let me tell you. When you go down that row and you take a look at those containers, you see all sorts of pretty colors. You know, you got the apple juice and you got the grape juice and you got the cran grape juice and the list goes on and on and on, right? And as you're walking down there, and I'm not a big fan of juice, but I know that juice is good for you to drink, isn't it? I mean, real juice is good for you to drink. So when I'm going down the aisle and I'm picking out the juices to drink, and if I'm going to have to drink this vile stuff, what I want to make sure that I get is I want to make sure that I get the 100% juice. Isn't that what you want? Now, when you walk down the aisle and you take a look, there are labels on top of these these containers, and, and many times you'll see the 100% in real big letters because they want you to know that what is in this container is 100% the juice that you are desiring to have. But you'll also notice as you walk down the aisle that there are other containers that the color and the content look very much the same. But if you review the label, what you'll recognize is, is that it's a watered-down version of the juice. Brothers and sisters, I'm convicted that that's the type of aisle you and I and all of mankind walk down when it comes to making the decision as to whether we're going to believe in God or not. Believe in the Bible or not. Believe in Jesus or not. Believe in whatever it is that we hear from the Bible or not. It begins with making the determination, am I going to be 100% juice or am I going to be the watered down version? Am I going to be a 100% believer? Or am I going to kind of believe and have it watered down so that I don't have to be all in? Before I go any further in this message, here's what I want us to do. And I, I actually had some wonderful counseling opportunities this past week with some people. And it was cool because what I noticed is a pattern that was very similar with these folks. And what was good about that is that the answer was the same for both of them. And since I had a chance to see it in one, it was really cool as as I was able to reveal it in the other. And it's this. You and I do a great job at lying to ourselves about what we really believe in when it comes to God. Here's how I know. Because we convince ourselves that the things that we know, we convince ourselves that those are the things we really believe in, and there is a difference. In other words, I'm pretty sure that anybody here hear about God being the creator of the heavens and the earth? Anybody hear that? You know that? 
Adam and Eve, anybody ring a bell? You know that? This guy named Noah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jesus, the apostles. You all know those statistics, those names, those things, don't you? You know them? But there's a difference between knowing those things and believing that they're true and real. And I'm fairly convinced that most folks mistake knowing something for believing in something. And so the evaluation that I think that you and I need to make sure that we go through is that we get to be transparent with ourselves, honest with ourselves. Is it something that I know or is it something that I know and believe in? And if it is something that I know and I believe in, then why do I believe that it's true and how much of it do I really know? And how much of it do I really believe in? And I'm pretty convinced that by the time we get down, if we're really going to be honest with each other, and I'd like to suggest that you do a Bible study with yourself, and maybe write these things out, the things that you know or think you know about the Bible, about God, about Jesus. And you write those things out, and you take a look at that list, and you go, yeah, I know those things, but what do I really know about them? And do I really believe in the things that I say I know Brothers and sisters, this is imperative because if we don't, we are going to walk through life with a watered-down belief system and everything else that we do after that spiritually is going to be watered down. And so we're going to get frustrated. We're, we're not going to be satisfied with the nutrients that we think that we're ingesting this 100% belief system and that our faith is really strong, but we're wondering why it's not really strong. And I'll tell you why. Because you don't believe, at least not 100%. And that means that what you'll find is that your prayer life is lacking, that your, that your worship life is lacking, that your Bible study is lacking, that your seeking and saving lost souls is lacking, that your peace is lacking, that your joy is lacking, that your love is lacking. And all these things are lacking, not because you're not a decent person, it's lacking because you lack belief. So you don't have the nutrients, the nutrition, the substance needed in the area of belief to actually grow in your faith. Does this make sense? So brothers and sisters, this very first stop that we have is imperative for the rest of the series, and it's imperative for your study with people. They have to be convicted of not just knowing, but believing. So Jesus here teaches us so many areas, and I just scratch the surface. This is just so we make sure we, we keep Scripture backing up what's being taught here in the pulpit. Jesus teaches that this substance of faith takes belief in him. Look at the text. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things, you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Here's the one we all know. But did you know the verses before? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He does not believe, has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Is this fairly clear that you're going to have to believe in Jesus Christ being the resurrected Savior if you want to have any chance to get to heaven? Now, let me just put you to the test. Again, this is a personal test. I know that most of you know that, but do you really believe that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb? Do you really believe, I mean, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that Jesus ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father? Not because you know it, because since you were a little kid you had heard it, and not because you know it, because you sat in the pew and the preacher said it every week, but that you actually believe beyond any doubt that Jesus lives, that he's God, and that he sits on the throne ruling and having all authority in heaven and on earth. There is a difference between knowing these things 
and really believe in it. There's a difference between having a 100% belief and the watered-down version. Because, by the way, the 100% belief in this has a transformed life because of it. And that's fruit percentage that we can see. That's for another lesson, though. Here's the next text, John chapter 8, starting in verse 21. Then Jesus said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Do you believe that? You see, we're just setting up the surface. We're just starting with this initial content of belief. And so we need to believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Savior, the Messiah. And in doing so, one of the wonderful gifts that we need to believe in is that your sins and mine can be washed away by the one who came out of that tomb. Amen? Now, don't you think that that would then change some of our life behavior? If we really believed in Jesus setting the standard of right and wrong, truth and error, sin and salvation, that if we believed in him, truly 100% believed in him, do you see how it would change our lives and what we do? Not only that, but do you see how it would change our lives when it comes to having peace that surpasses all understanding? If we believe that Jesus Christ has the power and ability to wash away every sin, and if you believe that you've responded in that way, then why in the world would you be down and depressed and carrying the baggage of the past and being weighed down by all those sins that you say you believed have already been forgiven? You see how this works? A watered-down belief system doesn't carry on the joy that comes with being washed with the sins because you really don't believe in the washing that comes from the Messiah. One follows the next. You may know these things because you've heard them in church, but do you really believe in them to be true? Here's another one, John chapter 20, starting in verse 30. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Could you imagine the size of this book if God decided to have everything written down about Jesus that was done We'd have to have longer than 45 minutes for a sermon. That's for sure. See, this ties it back into where we began this journey. This is the book that God gave us. So that by reading these things in here, we can understand what the substance of faith is. And that first ingredient is belief. We did a beautiful study this morning about the prophecies and the Old Testament about Jesus and the fulfillment. And I'm telling you right now, this book is an amazing book. And when you really read it and believe it, beyond any shadow of a doubt, it proves that Christ is who he says he is. Do you know that? Do you believe it? Another passage here, this is just sort of to tie things up, this Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that seek him. You see, and here's the rub. The rub is in this area of making the decision as to whether we really want to seek him or not. Brothers and sisters, we have to connect this chain now. Today, right now, today, right now, today, right now, the word of God has been read to you, it's been spoken to you, and today, right now, you're making the decision as to whether or not you really want to know it and believe it. Right now. 
Every single day that goes by, there are opportunities where God's word comes out in some sort of way, even on that cruddy TV. Every once in a while, you'll hear a TV show or somebody will flip across the thing where there's a televangelist. Something takes place where the word of God is said in some sort of capacity, and you're going to have to make the determination what you're going to do with that word that's been thrown your way. It shows up in Matthew chapter 13. I want you to turn there really quickly with me. I'm going to try to do this as fast as possible. But I want you to see this now. This is a very popular section of Scripture. We've studied this several times before, but I want to have this different sort of angle toward it. In verse 13, it's the parable of the sower. Verse 11, Jesus answered and said, To you it had been granted mysteries to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted for you. For whomever has, to him shall more be given. And he shall have more abundance, but whoever does not have, even what has been shall be taken from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Verse 14, and in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, that you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return. And I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see, and did not see it. Hear what you hear, did not hear it. Now verse 18. Hear then the parable of of the sower. You see, this is the part of the story that most of you perhaps don't know. That you know the part about the farmer who goes out with the seed and he throws the seed and there's all these different types of soil. There's that really hard soil that rejects the seed. There's the rocky soil that receives it but rejects it. Then there's the the other soil that receives it and starts to grow but then the weeds or the thorns come in and choke it out. And then there's the good soil that the seed falls on and it grows and it flourishes. Now church, here's what I want you to get. The seed being the word of God is thrown out in your lives on a regular basis, which means that we receive little seedlets every single day. And what that also means is, and I want you to see this, that every time the seed or the word of God is sent out to you, it first starts on the surface, not underneath the surface. What most people miss in this parable is that the word of God, when it is given, when it is read, when it is preached, starts out on the surface of everybody's heart. And it's the heart's decision as to whether it wants to absorb what the seed is offering. And that is the belief. In other words, this. When you get to a person who really doesn't care, they don't care, they have already made up their mind, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in the Lord's church, they don't believe in whatever it is, their heart is so hard that when the seed or the word of God lands on that surface, lands in their mind, they quickly reject it. They don't care. It lands on the surface, that's it, it's gone. But here's where we start to come into play, because I'm pretty sure that everybody here this morning didn't get out of bed, make yourself look all pretty, come to the church building to be somebody who has that kind of hard heart. I'm fairly convinced that's true. But I think now what we're going to start getting into is the area of heart or soil that you and I perhaps might have. Maybe you have that sort of cracked soil. Maybe you have it. It's got rocks, but it's got cracks in it. It has places where the Word of God can land and can start to grow, okay? And I'm pretty sure that most people, most people have this type of soil in their itinerary, where you have this life where you have these rocks that have been built up, but you have enough crack where the Word of God can touch you, and you start to absorb it, and then you have what I call a surface belief. It's there, it's starting to penetrate, but for some reason you want to impede the growth of your belief. 
My question is why? Haven't you ever done this? Where you've heard something that you know, you've heard something that you believe, but you impede your belief. You, you stop it from, from growing, growing and gaining any depth in your life. I know I have. My question to you is, why did you stop it from growing? Now, we get an explanation here from, from Jesus. And, and he teaches us, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of God, word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. Verse 20, and the one whom the seed was sown on the rocky place, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the world, immediately he falls away. Now see, what we tend to miss is, is we tend to miss this. This happens all the time with the word of God coming into our lives on a daily basis. This happens all the time where the word comes out and we, we have it land on our heart. And then we have to make that decision. Do I believe that what that says is true? And now if I do believe what that says is true, how much am I going to let it penetrate my life and influence my heart, influence my actions, influence my fate? How much? And usually what happens, at least in some areas of these components, is that we choke it out. Because we don't want to make the changes that God is telling us to make in our life. So to protect ourselves... We rip that one out. Not that we don't have others, but we don't like that one. I'll give you a real simple one, and this is true for everybody. Anybody here ever tell a lie? Did you know lying was wrong? Did you know it was a sin? Uh -huh. So here you all know and you believe that it is a sin, and yet why in the world do we do it? Because we have a rocky heart when it comes to that seed. And it planted a little bit, got down a little bit, but we said, you know what? I don't really want to believe in that right now. So I will yank it out, roots and all, so I can proceed with doing what it is that I want to do. Rocky soil. Jesus goes on to say this. And the one whom I... The seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word, the worry of the world, and the deceitfulness of rich chokes the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I don't know how many toes I need to step on. I, I'm really, Paul, I'm very, very cautious about this. I'm pretty sure that most of us have this type of soil in our hearts too. But I want to take another different twist on this one. And I'm going to give you an example of this. This is the one where I think that we know and we believe. But we get so preoccupied and busy in other areas of life that it just chokes the things that we know and believe out. So much so that we don't desire to have any real depth. Let me give you an example. Raise your hand if you know Noah. Do you know who Noah is? Okay. Quickly tell me, what do you know of him? Just sort of throw it out. Noah, what do you know? Did he build a boat? He built a boat. Was he a preacher? Yeah, he's a preacher. Do you know how many years it took to build a boat? Somebody said, a while. <laughs> yep. Do you know why there was a flood? How much of the surface of the earth did the flood cover? Do you know why there was a flood? Do you know why there was a flood? Sin. Do you know what sin? Do you know where 
the sin started. Don't say Satan, I know that answer. Let me show you this. This is the difference between having the surface, little bit of roots, you know, pick and choose. We do some pruning and removing God's word. Yeah, I believe in it, but I don't want to believe it in right here. And yeah, I believe in it, but I, I'm getting choked out by the other things that are really important in my life. And so, yes, I'm getting some roots, but I'm getting them choked out too. And the reason is, is because I don't know the depth of God's word. The things that I say that I know, the things that I say that I believe in, I don't pursue or seek like Jesus tells me so that I have the roots that go down so deep that no matter what Satan tries to do, he cannot yank out the roots of the tree that stand by the water. So let me tell you, Noah, God, sin, the reason was people of the faith married people who were outside of the faith, and the people outside of the faith influenced the people of the faith, so much so that the people of the faith decided to join the people who were not of the faith. It wasn't like it was a world filled with debauchery. That there were little, you know, little prostitution things all over the place. It wasn't like that. It was just people who believed in a different type of God. They still had religion, they still had worship, they still went to those, those religious practices, but the faith people decided to allow the influence of the non-faith people to lead them away from the faith. And it came in the sanctity of marriage. Because when people get married and say, I do to another human being, we open ourselves up to become vulnerable in areas like the soul. And so that's why God teaches the lesson in Genesis chapter 6 to let us know about marriage and about faith and about cleansing and about the ark and about salvation and about a man dedicated to work hard and about a man who preached to his family and led his family to be on that boat too. You see, we're starting to get deeper in understanding and believing in these things because now what do I believe when it comes to marriage? Now what do I believe when it comes to who I marry? Now what do I believe when it comes to preaching the gospel? Now what do I believe when it comes to sharing the good news with my family? You see how these layers start to fill in when you know more than just the basics about the flood and all those cute little animals that come on the boat? When you start to recognize the depth of the truth and the further you go, and the more you believe, the more you want to dig, the more you want to dig, the deeper your roots go. And now you're starting to gain this great substance that is more than just a watered-down belief. It is a 100% belief that starts to transform the way that you live because you keep digging your roots deeper into the good soil of God. It comes with belief. I know my time is up, and i got a whole bunch of more slides to go. So get comfortable. <laughs> I laid these things out because I told you before, what I'm going to do is give you the opportunity to have a copy of this lesson when I'm done with it so that you can take it home and study it for yourself and then teach it to other people. And as I make a transition to my closing arguments... I want you to know that God is there to help you and I. He's there to help you and I when we have the struggle, when we do believe, but we still have some unbelief. And I'll be honest with you. I'm a believer, brothers and sisters, but I have some unbelief. Do you? And we have this tremendous story in Mark chapter 9 about this guy who has a son, and he comes up with Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I love this story. I love this story because this is so true for us, that we need to have the type of heart, the type of understanding in God to have this, I believe in you, Jesus, but I admit and I confess that there are some things in you that I do not know or some things that I do know but I don't believe in when it comes to you. So will you please help me believe more? Last time I checked, the access that God has to amazing, powerful things, including his word, to help change and transform the hearts of people to become believers is really spectacular. 
And so what I'm saying to you as we wind this lesson down, you need to challenge yourself, write it down. Okay, I know these things to be true, but do I believe them? And if I believe these things to be true, what is my depth of belief within these things? Do I really know why I believe what I believe? Am I convicted in them? And if not, Lord, help my unbelief so that I can be a 100% not watered down, so I can have deep roots, not just surface. Now I want to finish with this, and this is just something doctrinal and theological that we also have to go through. I have the list of things that we must believe in, and by all means, uh, read them when you have a chance to, things that we must believe in to have everlasting life. We get to this final section, though. is all... Is all the faith wrapped up in belief only? The answer is, of course, no. You see, here's where the doctrine starts to divide. This is where we get into some debates among some other religious groups who proclaim to have Christ as their Lord and Savior. Where they're going to say that faith only, it's faith only. Well, it's not quite faith only, it's faith only and belief only. Well, which only is it? Is it faith only or is it belief only? Well, it's both only. Oh, so it's faith and belief. So faith is belief only. Yes, okay. Is that true? The answer is absolutely unequivocally no. We have in Luke chapter 8, verse 26, where we have demons who are agents and angels of Satan. They not only believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but they confess him as the Messiah, and that isn't enough for them to be saved. Another example in Mark chapter 1. Another example in Mark chapter 3. And then, of course, James chapter 2, which we will spend some more time on later on in this series. Do you know the greatest believer out there in the world, in the universe, short of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is Satan himself? You won't find a greater believer. He believes in every single word of God. He does. Now I know because the scripture tells me so, Satan is destined for hell. So if belief only is enough to get you in, then that means that Satan would be qualified to get in. So church, you have to ask yourself in this container of faith that I have, do I have the substance of belief? And if so, how much do I believe? And how much is this belief changing me? Jason's lesson a couple of weeks ago, has started to really transform the way I see things. He did this lesson having to do with being identified as belonging to him. I believe so much in Jesus Christ. I believe so much that he rules my life, but there are times when I struggle with my identity because I sometimes don't believe in myself with Christ. And so what I did, tapping into this series of trying to learn what faith is, is I came up with this idea. You know these little rubber bracelets that kids just go crazy over? And adults do too? On it, it says, I am his. And and, and for the young folks and even the older folks and the adults, please just take one if you want one. There's this really radical pink and there's the blue over there. And if you'd like to, after the invitation song, to come on up after the closing prayer and grab one, please just grab one and grab one only because this is really kind of the theme of this whole idea about what faith is. Faith is, the faith is going to lead us so that we have him. And we can with great confidence say, I am his. I belong to him. Not because I say so, but because he says so. 
And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to invite you, those of you who need to come forward, who have during this lesson, look through your mind and you look through your heart and you started to recognize that, man, Ted, I know a lot of things, but I've convinced myself that knowing them is believing. But that's not true. I now know some things, but I don't necessarily believe 100% in these things. I need help. Come forward. If you have a watered-down faith, come forward. If you have a surface faith, come forward. If you've had the roots of God's word ripped from your life because of your lack of faith, come forward. If you don't belong to Jesus Christ, if you haven't been buried by faith through baptism into Jesus Christ to be raised up in newness of life, come forward. So that when we get done with this lesson, you can proudly grab one of these things and say, I am his. As we stand and sing the song of invitation.